give me a chance and better must come, better will come. And so they bought it. Michael Manley swept to power and became the country's fifth prime minister. He was following in the footsteps of his father, but had his own vision for the future of Jamaica. His would be a socialist agenda, grounded in a new sense of nation and based on its African heritage and black pride. In the early 1970s, he gave land to the farmers, created jobs for the poorest working class women, and most importantly, provided free education not just for the privileged, but for every child. Under Manley, Jamaicans would be in charge of their own destiny. This government has started a program of change, the like of which has never been seen in Jamaica. Young people were getting education at last. For years, women in this country never knew their own children. Because of the long hours, by the time they could get home, the children had to be asleep in bed. And nobody cared. And this government cared. Because of democratic socialism. He just bucked the system. He just went in there and picked up Jamaica by the roots and turned it upside down. That's what independence was about. You were a Jamaican. It didn't matter who was married or not married. You were a Jamaican. You were a member of that family. That was who you were. You had rights. I remember a woman saying it for the first time. I felt like I was walking in my own shoes. And that was when we got the gift of Jamaican independence, not with the flying of the flag. The social reforms of the 1970s in giving the Jamaican a sense of his own worth and dignity were huge. Much of that legislation was uh, in the most advanced in the world of its time. Kamanis Estate, where the lands as far as the eye could see, was owned by a single white family. Such privilege was commonplace. Manley wanted radical social reforms to favor the poor. Members of his own class were nervous. For the other Jamaica, the Jamaica of the wealthy and of the upper middle classes and, and the rich, uh, things were quite all right, thank you. Uh, they'd done very well in the 1960s, uh, you know, in, in the sort of last hurrah of the post-war economic boom. And why should it change? A country like Jamaica cannot become a just society if you don't redistribute some of the wealth and some of the benefits. And we have begun that process of redistribution. That was one of the things we disagreed on because for that. That all has been his hero, so in a way it was Kitzinger was staying just outside of Ocherius, and he asked Michael to come down and see him. And um, Michael talked to me about that, and I said, but I don't understand why you're a prime minister. Why are you going down there to see him? And he said, because he asked me to come down and see him. I said, you're a prime minister. He comes to see you at Jamaica House. And then Kissinger came in and saw him at Jamaica House. Kissinger asked Manley to condemn Castro's decision to send troops into Angola to fight South African-backed forces. Manley refused, showing solidarity with Castro and his utter contempt for apartheid. Kissinger doesn't come down here and, you know, stick his finger in Manley's face. He box his finger out of your face. That is almost a national cultural reaction to it. I say give thanks to the fact that Manley stood up to Kissinger despite everything else. Sometimes in history, you have to do that, and he did. Now there are certain people in the world who say now, 
Why are we taking this risk to anger the United States of America? And the answer is this, we are not angering the United States of America, they are angering themselves. They are not going to tell me what relationship I have with Fidel Castro. We have that friendship with Cuba as part of a world alliance of third world nations that are fighting for justice for poor people in the world. And I tell you as the party leader, as long as this party is in power, we intend to walk through the world on our feet and not on our knees. We paid for it, you know, we paid for it dearly in terms of aid. But Michael was very clear that, you know, it's certain things you just had to take a stand on. Very firm on that. At home, Manly's socialist dream had become a middle-class nightmare. If you don't like it, Manley told them, there are five flights a day to Miami. In the months that followed, thousands took his advice. Planes were packed with Jamaica's middle classes, taking their money with them. When the first serious attempt at change was made, as always happens, there is a sort of almost like a shockwave that goes through the people who are better off and who have never really questioned the nature of the society under them. And, uh, so you, you did have a, a very real and regrettable reaction to some aspects of change. Most of these were of the entrepreneurial class. So we had the horrendous picture of the country sliding into eight years of negative growth, record high inflation, record high unemployment. With the wealthy leaving in droves and USAID cut from $13 million to a mere four, Manley was in deep trouble. What he saw was an American conspiracy to bring him down. Let me tell you how destabilization works. They will go in the secret group that is trying to mash up the country. Will go in among the youth and find one that looked like a leader. And they call him one side, and they say, hey, brother, we drop you a thousand dollars on the side if you get the boys tomorrow night to go down across the road and carry out a raid. But him don't know that it is a destabilization agent that has paid somebody to come among him and sell the idea of starting a bitch of a street fight. Rumors were rife of covert U.S. operations on the island, aiming to make the country impossible to run and dangerous to visit. It would be known that some famous syndicated columnist of the United States was going to come to spend a week resting in some villa. And mysteriously, the first night he's there, gunmen would arrive and start firing guns round and round his villa. Nobody would be hurt. By the next morning, he's in a state of terror. He flies home, and 79 newspapers across America read the story of the violent, terrible society disintegrating with gunmen the next morning. So you get the next few thousand tourist cancellation. Suddenly, guns were everywhere. Michael's allies saw this as proof of a CIA plot. It was designed to remove the Manly government because he was too friendly with Cuba. We had to fight the good fight because that was what life was about, to resist these sort of overwhelming diktats as to how we should live. On Edward Siaga's second visit to a polling booth in downtown Kingston, a gun battle broke out. Well, we were actually uh, to fight a civil war to save our country at that time. The militancy that Manley brought through socialism uh, made it now something that wasn't around the corner and behind the scenes, but right out in the open. Whereas before there was coexistence, there was rivalry, I'm a JLP man, I'm a labor right, I'm a PNP man, I'm a comrade. And you know, my party better than yours or whatever. But it didn't, came to, it didn't come to people killing each other. As it got hardened, it came to that. 
The gangs of Tivoli and Trenchtown helped themselves to the imported weaponry. Rival politics had become sectarian, with daily battles between PNP and JLP supporters. Shootouts left hundreds dead and others caught in the crossfire. We were actually pinned down in a particular area for two and a half hours this morning while nothing less than 2,000 rounds of ammunition were fired. We cannot and will not stand by and allow this sabotage of our country to continue. The cabinet has accordingly advised the governor general to act and proclaim a state of public emergency. When they called the state of emergency, they locked up all the frontline leadership of the Jamaica Labour Party, the frontline workers. I was one of those who was locked up. I was detained for seven months, kept in, in indefinite detention, no charge. I would have moved the world for Michael Manley, for the people's man. Yeah. Him see the people, him see the struggle of the people. Go off for the last man, go off for the people, all the way. Put up on the people, go off for the people, all the way. Michael had enough grassroots support to win the 1976 election, but the crisis still deepened. Foreign businesses found more friendly places to invest their money. They frightened away every foreign investor that we had, and a lot of local investors at the same time, because they were threatened, they were told that they were not the sort of people that were not wanted here, uh, that Jamaica was going to be a socialist country, and that uh, the capitalist was no longer welcome. Uh, America was called a wicked imperialist capitalist nation and exploiter and the whole ambience of the place was very frightening to any kind of investment. Of greater concern, the urban poor were losing patience. Michael Manley had no choice but to bow to US pressure as his socialist dream of a free, equal, independent Jamaica crumbled before his eyes. He went to the World Bank and effectively handed over the running of the country to the IMF. Jamaica's future would now be in the hands of foreigners. He was, you know, a sort of proud person who felt that although your country was small, that you had rights like everybody else. And I think he realized the extent to which these rights were going to be withdrawn. Less than 20 years of independence had brought the island back to financial slavery. The IMF loan of 29 million was not enough and came with strings attached, which put an end to social reforms and led to shortages. We can't get oil, we can't get detergent, we can't get flour, we can't get rice. And everything on a whole you can't get. For some crazy reason, I chose to have a baby in that 1980 election year. And he was premature. He was in the hospital for about three weeks in the intensive care unit at the hospital for premature babies. And I was able to interact with working class mothers on a day-to-day -day basis. They'd all come. We'd all come to visit the baby and our babies. And, you know, we'd talk. And one of the things we talked about was the shortage of foodstuff. <laughs> I saw people who were willing to die just to free Jamaica at that time because the people felt that they were in bondage. There are people who left Jamaica who died abroad, very, very unhappy and very sad. There are people who still live abroad who swear they'd never come back to Jamaica because that was such a bad experience for them. It was the downfall. I'm telling you, it was a period where people hated him. They really hated him. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister, Edward Philip George Siaga. 800 people died in the run-up to the bloody 1980 election. Manley was on the ropes. In a bitter contest, he finally conceded to his rival, Edward Siaga. Had he not conceded, 
Jamaica's future today would have been completely different. For one thing, the United States would have overt